Hello, everyone. Welcome to another Channel 781 News City Council debrief. This week in the City Council, uh, Councillor Cates congratulated the Waltham Show Choir on a big win at the Show Choir Festival. There was a resolution to improve sidewalk safety. There was a hearing for Broxton Properties who were asking for a license for fuel storage. Um, at this, uh, so we'll talk about all of those things. And also at this meeting, we noticed uh, most of the counselors were not wearing masks for most of the meeting. So we'll talk a little bit about that. And I also have sort of a correction slash update about something we discussed um, from last week's committee meetings, uh, having to do with the finance committee and the traffic study for cannabis dispensary. So I'll update you a little bit on that. So I'm here with Chris Gamble. Hi, everyone. And James Critellis. Hi, everyone. And our special guest tonight, uh, our policy expert, when uh, we decide we don't want to just make stuff up on our own anymore and we need an expert, we're here with Christine Mackin. Hi, everybody. Thanks for asking me back this week. So we'll start off actually um, with the question about the sidewalk. So there was a resolution submitted by several counselors, I think it was almost all the counselors were signed on to it, um, to improve safety on sidewalks. And they said the idea was to start a conversation. We don't have a text, the text of this resolution because it was a late file. Um, it wasn't in the packet that was sent out prior to the meeting. So we don't know the exact wording. Um, but our understanding and how they talked about it in the meeting was they want to discuss what we can do to improve sidewalk safety. And this is probably prompted by our recent uh, snowstorms, where, as you may have noticed, a lot of the sidewalks, especially in the residential areas, are not cleared. And that means when you try to walk somewhere, you have to walk in the middle of the street, which is not very safe and more of a problem for some people than others. So to give a little background for those who don't know, in some communities such as Boston and also Newton, they have an ordinance that people have to clear their sidewalks. Um, the responsibility is on the property owner. Um, often the renters end up doing it, but uh, it's, it's the, if they don't do it, uh, there you can get a fine and the fine goes to the landlord. So Newton has the same ordinance as Boston where property owners are responsible for clearing the sidewalk. In Watertown, businesses are required to clear their sidewalk, um, but residences are not. They actually discussed an ordinance for that in 2012, but decided against it. Um, in Belmont and Weston, uh, nobody is required to shovel, though there is an ordinance that says you can't push snow from private property onto public property, and that includes pushing it onto the sidewalk or the street. And Lincoln doesn't have a policy about it as far as I could find. So to get some background on this, I'd love to go to Christine. Christine, what is, uh, what is um, Waltham's policy on this? How do we deal with snow on the sidewalks? And, and what would be our options if we wanted to improve that? So right now, Waltham does not require sidewalk clearing for the majority of the city. Um, we have a ordinance in the general ordinances section that defines a certain region along Moody and Main Street where the tenant of the property is responsible for clearing the snow. Since this is primarily commercial areas, usually that falls into the responsibility of whatever business is occupying that space. But if the space is unoccupied, then the landlord uh, would be responsible for it. What that means is that if I had a sidewalk in front of my house, coincidentally, I don't, but if I did, uh, I have no obligation to clear it. Um, there are a number of big businesses in Waltham, um, including Children's Hospital and Brandeis University, which are close to where I live, that will voluntarily clear it. And then the city clears some sidewalks, primarily along walking routes to the elementary schools. I live close to Stanley Elementary and they'll clear portions along South Street to make it easier for kids to get to school. But other than that, it's just a free for all. Um, one thing I will note is that in the state of Massachusetts, if you do not clear your sidewalk and somebody slips and falls and gets injured, you can be liable for the cost of their medical care or other kinds of compensation. So there's an incentive from the state, but anybody who's been out walking around Waltham in the last week has seen that that people either don't know about that or it's not a sufficient incentive to clean up. 
So it sounds like the options would be we could either expand what the city is clearing or we could create a, a new ordinance or update that ordinance to put more responsibility. Uh, so it sounds like we have an ordinance now, a mandate, but it's just for a very limited area. So we could mm -hmm. potentially expand that to the whole town. Yes. Um, we could ask the city to clear it, um, but expanding the ordinance to cover more regions is sort of the more common options that municipalities go after. Um, and you listed a big comparison, but I actually have a link to a Boston Globe article that lists all of the municipalities in Massachusetts. It's a little outdated since it's from 2016, but if anybody wants to compare, I can share that link. Thank you. Um, so Chris and James, what was your impression? We only know what they said in the meeting about it. And based on the comments with you made, do you think they're they're going to try something big like changing the ordinance or what do you think is likely to happen with this? One of the things I saw uh, Councillor McLaughlin mentioned was that they uh, could potentially be buying like a more snow clearing equipment. So that sort of to me sets the horizon. That, oh, we're gonna probably be trying to clear more spots and buy some equipment to, to facilitate that. But um, one of the sort of outgrowths of changing the resolution to include more areas is that in sort of in that it ultimately falls on the tenant. And I've heard from like residential tenants at least that like they'll get told by their landlord that they're responsible for clearing their sidewalk. And if they go and look up the ordinance, it's like, oh here, but it's like for specific streets. And if that gets expanded and starts to include more, it's just pushing it's just gonna get pushed down on the tenants rather than be something that the property owner is responsible for. So I don't really see much productive to come out of this either way. But, but I think that getting more stuff cleared is probably the best outcome we can hope for. I mean, even if it gets that far, um, I mean, we don't have the exact wording in front of us, but I think the therefore be resolved was that the mayor would work with the CPW and other departments to begin a conversation around solutions to snow on the ground or something. Um, so, I mean, more of a question for Christine. I mean, how do you, do you think that that was worded correctly and how do you see this playing out and what should they have done if they were going to make it a more teeth teeth teethy resolution um coming from someone who did something very similar in your time on the city council um so what i did when i was on the council is i actually introduced a resolution to expand the sidewalk clearing ordinance um i did not do a good job shepherding it through the rules and ordinances committee which is why it ended up being filed at the end of the day um, Prior to introducing that, I did have a conversation with CPW and they indicated right now they don't have the capacity either in personnel or equipment to do all of the sidewalk clearing. Just from a policy perspective, I would prefer that the city take over clearing the sidewalks for a lot of the reasons James listed. Um, some other communities in Massachusetts are talking about or have had the municipality take on that responsibility. And there's a lot of benefits to that for people who are out of town or people who aren't able to clear the snow. Um, so that's, if we can get the city to clear it, I would rather see that than to write an ordinance saying that individual properties are responsible for clearing their snow. That said, I think there are two major obstacles in the way of this. And one is that the mayor of Waltham is rather parsimonious. Um, she doesn't like to spend money having the city provide services if there's any way that she can avoid it. And that either looks like not having the service at all or contracting it out to somebody else. For example, my street is cleared by a private contractor who's employed by the city after snowstorms and not by city-owned equipment. So that is kind of more of a budget and logistics question. The obstacle I think to having CPW take it over again is their personnel and their capacity um, because it would take a lot of people running the equipment, a lot of hours to clear all of the sidewalks in the city. So maybe it would make more sense to pilot it on some major streets and expand the areas around the schools to clear them a little bit more. Um, 
and I know this is grouches of Waltham and you guys are not affiliated with Waltham Watch News, but I did hear that the schools have a weather control gun in their basement. So one solution to solve the snow problem is to just make it stop snowing. I heard that also. Let me ask, so why do you think it would be preferable for the city to do it as opposed to mandating property owners to do it just because then it would actually get done? Is that- The point of government is to provide services that improve people's lives. But <laughs> why do we pay taxes so that the city can organize systems to make our lives better? And if we think that it would make our lives better to have the sidewalks cleared, we should just pay for it. Good answer. Thank you. <laughs> um, I wanted to mention so the, the uh, James touched on this, but I think it's important. The current ordinance that applies to some streets puts the responsibility on the tenants. And if you were to expand that to the whole city, that would be extremely difficult to enforce because the city doesn't have an up to date list of tenants. Landlords mm -hmm. don't report to them every time they get a new tenant, but the city does have up to date lists of property owners. So as an enforcement matter, it would be much easier to put the responsibility on property owners if the city doesn't want to pay for it. But I think I get the sense that would be a pretty big cultural change because landlords haven't been asked to do that in the past. That, that, that would be a big change for Waltham, I think. Yeah, it absolutely would. Um, and that's one of the things where I think comparing to other municipalities is a little bit interesting depending on how they word their ordinances who actually ends up being responsible and how that cost gets portioned out if you're going to find the landlords are they just going to pass it on to their tenants um and then you're not protecting the tenants anyway um depending exactly how you write it and how you enforce it okay thank you very much so moving on uh to our next issue um, there was a hearing in this meeting for Boston Properties requesting um, a fuel storage license. It was referred to the Licenses and Ordinance Committee, is that correct? License and Franchise. Licenses and Franchise, sorry. Uh, yeah, so um, that wasn't, not much happened with this, but we did notice that uh, counselors asked a few questions before they referred it, which seems to indicate um, there's something interesting going on here. So James, can you just give us a little bit of background on who is Boston Properties? They're a, I guess, construction and development company that has like a hand in a lot of the commercial real estate in Waltham. Uh, this particular property is on the uh, west side of Waltham, the other side of 128, uh, on the up, by the, the reservoir that you'll see as you drive by. And basically the meat of the issue is that they're converting what is a large commercial office building into lab space. So they needed a bigger fuel storage license. And most of the questioning was just sort of, it felt like due diligence in line with that. But uh, yeah, it, honestly, the thing that was most notable to me was that as soon as they were, anyone was start asked to talk about it, they were just like, oh, mass them off and right, right into the podium. <laughs> Uh, well, not, the, not much notable about the questioning other than just sort of like, why are you doing this? What is this for? Type of thing. Okay, so we'll we'll keep an eye on that. Um, and oh, so moving on to uh, this is I have a little bit of a correction slash update having to do with the finance committee, um, which met last week and um, it was recorded by WCAC. And when I watched the recording, I noticed some more stuff that we didn't notice when we talked about it. Um, on our debrief. And what I noticed was that Councillor Bradley MacArthur asked who's going to be paying for the traffic study for the cannabis dispensary. So I wanted to note that because we were hoping someone would ask that. So I'm glad that she did. And it turned out the answer was, it's going to be trade for out of a traffic fund. They, um, there was another project that needed a special permit and the city council determined that they were going to have a certain impact on traffic. So they were required to pay into a fund and uh, the money for the traffic study is now gonna come from that fund. So I've been speculating on several different episodes about why um, they're doing that traffic study. And this suggests a possible explanation, which is that they're planning on asking the cannabis dispensaries to pay into this fund. And so this study would provide uh, the backup to show why that's necessary. 
and uh, then it would make sense that they're paying for the study out of this fund because it's kind of an investment. I don't know for sure that's what's going on, but that kind of makes sense what we know now. So um, I'm going to try to learn a little bit more about that traffic fund, and we'll talk about that on a future episode to get uh, a little more background on how that works. And the last thing we wanted to address was uh, James and Chris, you were actually there. Um, who were people wearing masks? It, was I was I accurate in saying that most of them were not wearing masks most of the time? I think it's a fair assessment. The uh, from most of the uh, proceedings, it definitely looked like there was only like four, maybe five counselors that had masks touching their faces and covering their mouth and those, which is a little concerning, but I guess COVID is over. Yes, COVID, COVID is over. I mean, it just seems like a very easy thing to do is just to continue wearing masks. I, I mean, I can share my screen. I think, I think, I think it's actually unfair to say that most wear it. I think, you know, we can count it. Let's count it right now. I'll share my screen. Um, yeah, I think this is most, right? But still, a shocking number, shocking number of people not wearing masks. Um, and I mean, the city just says that they're doing everything to stop the spread of COVID. And then it just decides to do to do things that just is blatantly not true at all. And then it decides to do things that are just like weird. Like, um, like if anybody goes through any municipal buildings, they have this sign that's on all of the rooms that says this office has been sanitized with our bleach gun. This is an older photo. There's actually three pieces of paper. I think the one most recent is in February. It's just hilarious. It's like this guy, Steve, is doing all of his, his best running around the city, spraying bleach everywhere, and but people can't, can't wear a mask. Um, so thank you, Steve, for uh, all you do for the city. Um, and uh, I just, I don't know, it just seems like, why stop wearing masks? Why are you sending the signal that that's okay to do right now. It's a shame. My comment, oh, what I wanted to add to this was for those who don't know, who haven't been to the city council in person, it's a really cramped room. The city council chamber is a very bizarre kind of room where the there's kind of the place where you'd expect the audience to be, there's nothing. The audience is on both sides of where the action is happening and even and the counselors are very cramped. So if you're somebody who is particularly concerned about not getting infected right now, um, for example, you have someone in your family who's being treated for cancer and you need to drive them to get chemo. And if you get sick, all their chemo gets canceled. People are dealing with situations like that. And if you're dealing with a situation like that, you can't go to city council because it's not going to be safe. So what I was wondering is if they want to have them in person, why don't they do them at School Street where they have that much bigger space and people could spread out? So it's like, if you're going to give the people choice about wearing masks and give people choice not to be cramped right into you. So I wonder if that's an option. Of course, a better option might just be to do them virtually. And I think maybe some of the concern about that is it's not clear whether the open meeting law allows for virtual meetings. Um, um, is that true? I mean, other cities are still doing virtual. I think the city of Newton hasn't met for their city council since COVID has started. They've literally been doing virtual the entire time, either that or Medford. I think it might just be both. Um, but uh, I mean, the city of Waltham could be doing better for their municipal meetings um, in regards to COVID. Yeah, and it would be interesting to hear why why we're not doing them virtually. You know, we haven't heard anybody. We we just get an announcement that they're meeting in person. We don't necessarily get a a reasoning behind it. So it'd be interesting to know what people are thinking about this. And uh, so. Going back to Councillor Kate's shout out to the show choir, which I heard this and I was like, oh, isn't that nice that instead of just honoring athletic teams in that way that the, the, the show choir kids get honored in that way too. But Chris, you had a different take on it. Well, not necessarily different. I mean, it's just, it's so nitpicky for people like me that watch every single one of these meetings. There's just a certain way you're supposed to go about doing things. And so I'm like hyper-focused on like the new counselors um, and just trying to figure out like how much, how much they're like following rules and stuff. So, I mean, if you've never been to the city council, how the meeting goes is there's the intro, which is just going over like the date and where they are and stuff. Um, and then the 
Pledge of Allegiance, which has everyone in the room stand up, which is like a really weird uh, thing that Americans do. Um, and then there's a moment of silence for troops that passed away. Um, and then they have to acknowledge that this meeting is being recorded um, and that if anybody else is recording, fun fact, I single-handedly made them do that. And now they do that every single meeting. They never did that. And then I started recording meetings myself and they now do it forever. So I single-handedly did that. And then they go into the minutes and then the whole thing. Um, and then sometimes when someone passes away before the recording and after the moment of silence, they have that time where someone can say, you know, I just, uh, a counselor, and usually the chair rep recognizes you and you do that. Um, and then Paul decides, um, and it seemed, apparently they, everyone knew, apparently the chair knew this, but she seemed confused. So I don't know if Paul just decided to do this abruptly, but yeah, during that space of time between the moment of silence and the recording, Paul gets up and is like, I don't want to announce something. And then um, talks about the show choir, goes on like a two minute uh, spiel about how great they are, which is awesome. You know, I'm very happy to be acknowledging that. But I just think like, uh, that is more of a resolution. It should, they should have been a resolution and uh, it should have been on the docket and it, they should have been invited and it would have been great and it would have been an awesome thing. Um, it kind of reminds me of actually uh, Christine, our special guest, uh, her first resolution ever was a bike rack resolution. And, and like, it was just like, it, it could have been done differently and to be more effective. And it's just funny because like, you know, just new counselors learning how, to, how the city council works and how it moves. And so um, just gonna, but, and I would like to end on the note that Paul is, I am impressed with Paul. I think he's uh, tenacious and it's just kind of just, you know, whatever strong opinion he has, he's going with it, which I love. Um, so I would like to end on that. And I would like to say that this is not a criticism, just an observation. Thank you, Chris. Uh, and then the last thing we have for you, we also mentioned in our last episode and we did a special report on it, but we're gonna say it again, cause it's important. Um, this Wednesday night, I'm, which is either tomorrow or tonight, depending on whether, when you're watching this, <laughs> But the Wednesday evening, the school committee is meeting and there are two things on the agenda that you might wanna be there to make public comments about. One is they'll be deciding whether to continue to require masks in school. Um, the other is the recommendation. Um, we talked uh, last time about how there was a complaint made about two books in the school library and there was a committee that met and recommended keeping those books in the library. That recommendation will be on the agenda. So that means people can make public comments and um, probably will. So if you'd like to be there um, to, if you have something to say in public about that, then try to be there at the high school Wednesday evening, 7 p.m. Masks are required. There was another school committee meeting where masks were required, but some people managed to get in without them. Um, so if you're particularly trying to be safe, you can double mask or, or stay in the corner or do what you need to do. Um, but be there if you can to speak up um, for kids in the school um, and both of these issues. Any final thoughts from anyone before we sign off for tonight? Um, no, I think it was a pretty uh, straightforward night. There wasn't too much discussed, which is a shame. You know, with all the problems in the world, like sometimes we just like say nothing and we end at nine o'clock and we just go home. Isn't there anything else to talk about? And one of this is that meeting. And also this is a meeting where things are put to committee. And so next week, I know that there's not actually not that exciting except for the economic and community development meeting, which we, which we talked about last week. So there is a development there, but I know going into the meeting next week, like there's actually not that much to talk about. So it's a shame uh, that we can't talk about things that matter in the city a little more. Well, we're, that's when we do the in-depth analysis. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much, Christine Mackin, for being here. Thank you, Chris and James. I will see some of you at the school committee meeting, and I'll see you next week for another city council debrief. Bye, everyone. Bye, everybody. Uh, thanks, everyone.